good evening. I'm Bill Brown from Brookings Mountain West, so let me welcome you to our, actually this is our last lecture of the academic year. So thank those of you who've made it to our lectures before. Uh, we have another timely lecture tonight, as you might guess from the title. Uh, and if you've opened your fuel bill or recently, uh, uh, you'll see some direct relevance to this. We're really pleased to have Cliff Gaddy with us tonight. Cliff's an economist and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and an expert on Russia, obviously, uh, given the to his topic tonight. You may have heard him on KNPR this morning. If so, he's going to expand upon that. And uh, for those of you uh, who are on our mailing list and that we have contact information for you, we'll be announcing our lecture series for next fall and spring in the near future. So be ready for emails on that. Check our website. And with that in mind, I'll introduce Cliff, who's going to give a talk. And then there'll be time for some questions and answers at the end. Cliff? Thank you very much, Bill. Um, thank all of you for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have a chance to be here for a few days at, at the university, and uh, especially to give this, this talk. I never know in audiences of, uh, like this if people know very much about Russia, if they're interested in my topic because I'm talking about Russia, or whether they're interested in the topic because I'm talking about oil, because I'm going to be talking about both. And I hope for those of you who are interested in and know something about oil and energy, maybe a little bit more information about Russia, the world's largest producer of oil and gas, could be of value to you. And conversely, those of you who may be very knowledgeable or interested in Russia may get a different uh, or an additional perspective on understanding Russia by understanding how important Russia's oil and gas is to that country, both economically and, I argue, also politically. What I really will be talking about is, is the Russian economy, about how this economy works. Uh, I'll look back with a historical perspective, in fact, even going further back than 1970, and try to look forward a little bit. But when I say understanding the Russian economy, first thing that comes to mind is talk about a difficult task, a moving target. Even if the, those of us who study Russia very closely often ask ourselves, What's going on? Because, you know, you, one day you read Russia is a basket case. Uh, the next day you read Russia is resurgent, somehow flexing its petro muscles. It's a petro bully, to use Tom Friedman's term. And then suddenly the next time it's collapsed again. Uh, and then, where is it right now, by the way? Is it, is it down? Is it up? Um, it's an economy on a roller coaster. There's no question about that. Now, admittedly, the entire world economy has been on something of a roller coaster, and maybe we're still waiting for that ultimate upward climb again. But Russia is the extreme even compared with the rest of the world. And I want to give some examples. I mean, one common way to judge the performance of, an eco of a country's economy, and not, certainly not the only way, not maybe even the best way, but it's a common way, is to look at the performance of its stock market. Let me give you then this picture. In the year 2008, when every major stock market in the world suffered badly, not just a little, but badly, Russia was the worst performing stock market in the world in 2008. And that's saying a lot. If you had invested $100 in a Russia index market fund, tracking the stock market uh, performance, on January the 1st of 2008, by the end of that year, that $100 would be worth $23. It lost $77. However, if you'd been smart enough or lucky enough to wait and invest on January the 1st, 2009, at the end of that year, you would have been able to collect your original $100 plus about $146 extra dollars. Russia had more or less the best performing stock market in the world, roughly tied with Brazil in 2009. And by the way, in 2010, it was also up there among the very best performers. So quite a sharp climb and drop on that roller coaster over the past three years. But we don't just look at these last couple of years. Go back even further. Um, 
Think back to the decade of the 1990s. After the fall of communism, Russia in the 1990s, I think, truly was a basket case. It lost something like 50% of its GDP over that decade. That's much worse than anything that's happened to any country in this current global financial crisis. It's worse even than the Great Depression for the United States. That was the 1990s. But then, in the next decade, from 1999 to 2008, before the global financial crisis, Russia turns out to be the fastest growing economy in the world, starting from a low base, of course, but nevertheless, quite impressive growth. Measure, its GDP measured in dollar terms at market exchange rates, which is the way you would do it to try to talk about a share of the global economy, Russia not only grew faster than virtually any other, well, than any other major economy in the world, it grew twice as fast as China did in that period. And we always think of China as this outstanding performer. Um, and compared, in fact, with the other members of the so-called BRIC group, that's Russia, Brazil, India, and China, you can see Russia with the blue curve there, uh, even after this bad collapse in 2008, still uh, looks better. Russia's share of the total global economy grew at an even more impressive rate. Uh, again, beginning at a low base, it grew three and a half times faster than China. So Russia's share of the global economy, now China's still much larger share of the global economy than Russia. But again, think of it in terms of dynamics, relative performance. But my real point is, it doesn't stop there. We can go back even further. And in fact, this same pattern of extreme ups and downs goes at least 40 years back. My title was 1970 to 2011 and, be and beyond. And it's very obvious that the reason Russia's economy is like a roller coaster, or it is on a roller coaster, is because that there is a roller coaster it's on, and that's the world oil price. And I just want to make this point. Look at this chart of oil prices, world oil prices, since 1970 in real inflation-adjusted terms. So we can compare. That, that's what, in the 1980s, as you see, what, uh, what the world oil price would have been in today's dollars. Um, it, is, it is pretty astounding, and especially the volatility, the sharp fluctu fluctuations up and down, huge swings, repeated instances of prices changing by hundreds of percent within just a couple of years. And that then brings me to the single most important fact I think you have to remember about Russia's economy, and that is even going back that, that far. Everything depends on oil and gas. And that's what I want to talk about. I mean, how important has oil and gas been, and how it shaped so much of the rest of the economy and also its political economy. Everything depends on royal, oil and gas. How important is oil and gas? Well, to begin with, Russia is, it has a lot of these two commodities. Russia is, a, by a good margin, the largest producer of, and exporter of oil and gas in the world. And it's likely to retain that position for a number of years to come. Um, and this is despite new discoveries of different types of, of natural gas, so-called shale gas and so forth. Uh, Russia's reserves of conventional natural gas uh, are huge. They're by far, far and away, the largest in the world. And as far as oil reserves are concerned, we just don't know how much oil R Russia has. This is, of course, a country with the biggest territory in the world. And on a great deal of that territory, there's oil there somewhere. Uh, the question is exactly where, what type of oil, geological formations, difficulty of accessing. I'll talk about that later on. But, but the fact is, not only is a huge proportion of Russia's territory has never been geologically explored by oil experts, a large part of that territory, nobody's ever set their foot on it. Right? I mean, it is so vast and immense and remote. Um, clearly, the oil and gas have been key to Russia's economic prosperity. That's pretty obvious. But probably more important, and this is a point I want to come back to, they are the key to its very sovereignty and its geopolitical weight in the world. And I'll talk more about the role of oil and gas in securing Russia's sovereignty. But let me just say here flatly that 
today, right today, I would say that oil and gas are arguably more important for Russia's security than its nuclear weapons are. Let's go back, though, to the economy. Um, the two key structural facts that I want to stress about the Russian economy and the oil are first, as I've already indicated, how dominant oil is, oil and gas, um, the value that flows from the oil and gas, which economists refer to as rent, so I may be using these terms interchangeably, value or uh, resource, abundance, wealth, and rents, uh, how important they are for the economy as a whole, but also very important to recognize how highly concentrated the sources of value are. In any economy that is highly dependent on its resources, political and economic power flow from control over this wealth, these, the flow of these rents. Russia is and always has been resource dependent. The resources may have varied over a long span of Russian history, and I mean more than just today's Russia or the Soviet Union, even back into Tsarist Russia. But it's, it's always been about who controls the flow of these rents, of this wealth. And in fact, over the course of its history, Russia has experienced cycles in the nature of control. Uh, periods of centralized control have been followed by periods of decentralized control and vice versa. A key moment in this history of control of the rents, centralized versus decentralized, occurred in 1928. That was when, that was the beginning of the full-fledged system of so-called Stalinist central planning the abolition, full abolition of private property, and the brutal coercion of an economic system based on forced labor. Stalin's decision to launch that program, including the Gulag, was a direct result of his approach to managing the resource rents. Stalin did not want the Soviet Union to be rent dependent. Uh, he felt that that made the Soviet Union potentially very vulnerable to the West, to the imperialist. In one of his speeches in 1928, he said that the goal of his economic program was to end once and for all Russia's status, the Soviet Union's status, as a, quote, raw materials appendage to the imperialist West. If the USSR was to survive, he said, it had to stop exporting crude commodities Included at that time was a lot of agricultural commodities. Export, stop ex exporting these crude commodities to the, to the advanced countries and receiving manufacturers from them in exchange. That made the Soviet Union highly vulnerable to its enemies. And the only way it could avoid that dependency and that vulnerability was to build its own manufacturing base. And in fact, in Stalin's notion, it needed to be self-sufficient in virtually all major industries so that it could not be held hostage by its enemies. Stalin, in, in our current terminology, would say he was a, very much in favor of diversification of his e economy. Now, diversification as an economic notion is a highly valid idea of trying to, uh, to, to, to take advantage, uh, to minimize the risk of being fully dependent on especially the prices of any particular commodity, uh, and hedge your bets, if you like. It makes economic sense in any country. Stalin's idea, however, was not based on that sort of an economic notion of minimizing that market risk. It was rather motivated by a notion of preserving sovereignty by not being dependent on any other country. And it actually led to a, a, a form of autarky, that's with a K, not a CH, but the economic notion of being fully self-sufficient, not needing to be able, have to trade with other countries, reduce your dependence completely on other countries. And as a result, and also thanks to the fact that, of course, there was also an economic system in place in the Soviet Union that rejected the idea of market prices, free uh, f uh, private property shaping supply and demand and setting prices, uh, there was no way to recognize really the value or the cost, I must say, of, of, of any one particular economic approach versus another. He was guided strictly by this notion of we must build our own self-sufficient industry. That meant that the wealth generated from the resource industries would be used to build up the manufacturing sector. 
at, but these manufacturing plants did not necessarily and certainly were not being chosen uh, on the basis of what is most profitable, what adds most value to our economy. They were based on this uh, sense of we must reduce the dependence on the outside. And he had a number of, of, of principles involved in, in trying to develop this. Number one was obviously state ownership of the sources of value, of rent. S the state would direct the deployment of resources as opposed to uh, markets and prices determining that. And the state would allocate the rents to, uh, to, to choose the priorities of the use of the rents for building and sustaining this, what turned out to be largely value subtracting industrial base. But the important thing for the rest of our story, because this could be talked about in, at length and in great detail, is that by prioritizing the use of the oil and gas wealth and other resource uh, wealth at the time to industrialize in this particular manner, it turns out that Stalin created what later could be considered to be almost a genetic predisposition to addiction, to the, to the continuing infusion of this kind of value in rents. And this would come back to eventually first just burden the Soviet economy, and eventually, I think, just destroy it. Um, and I, I, I use the term genetic predisposition. I, what do I mean by this? Well, I mean that in the sense of almost literally changing the physiology of the economy. It's not a matter of policy. If it were only policy, the changes that occurred with the collapse of the Soviet Union, central planning, and communism should have remedied the situation. You change the system. You choose different policies, different priorities. A different economic system is put into place. But what was going on from the time he began in the late 1920s up until the end of the Soviet Union, 60 years later in the late 1980s, is the economy itself, the physical structure of the economy, is shaped by this process that I described. And physical structure, I mean the nature of the industries, the plants, the factories that are being created where they are located, not a trivial matter, where they're located in the country and what they would produce, obviously. The physical structure, the interrelationships, the production chains, the supply and production chains of who supplies the electricity or the gas or the fuels to which factories that produces which metals and where those metals go to the machine building plants and then who, who gets the, the equipment that's produced by the machine building plants, all connected in chains that planners decided that become a structure in itself. Um, from the mid-1950s, Stalin dies in the early 1950s, for the next 25 years, the Soviet economic system progressively exhausted its potential. Growth rates declined steadily. The growth rate, industrial growth rate in the late 1970s was barely one-fourth of what it had been in the 1950s. But at the precise, and one can speculate, was not the Soviet Union on the verge of collapse already in the late 1970s. But at precisely this point, when things seem to be at their worst, what happens? That is the point at which world oil prices just explode, um, as you can see right there. Um, world oil prices increased by a factor of seven in the second half of the 1970s. Moreover, this happens exactly at a point in which the Soviet Union had invested heavily in developing and expanding its own domestic oil and gas production massively by developing new fields, especially in western Siberia. Years of investment had just come to fruition in the, in, 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 at this point when the oil prices go up. So all of a sudden, the Soviet Union can pump massive amounts of these resources, which are worth multiples of what they had been before. This flood of rents gave new life to the Soviet economy, but it did so at a cost because then it makes this whole system even more addicted to rents. I mean, that's the nature of addiction. You'd never get enough. The more you get, the more you need, the more you want. You see that what was happening then was with this infusion of new wealth, they're able then to continue to build factories, plants, build whole cities or expand existing cities in places that had begun, a process that had begun in the Stalinist period using forced labor. There's no more forced labor in that extreme sense of the gulag, but now you have resources that allow you to continue doing it nevertheless. In other words, the rent explosion, if, I, if, if in fact Stalin lays the basis for a kind of genetic predisposition to addiction through his industrialization policies, the explosion in 
oil and gas rents in the 1970s, it's like the dope peddler appearing on the scene and just passing out you know, massive amounts of new, new, uh, new, new dope. So um, some of this was motivated, some of this expansion in the 70s was motivated by ideology. There was a notion of the Soviet Union just had to be the biggest, it had to have the biggest plants, it had to produce more steel, more coal, more whatever than anybody else in the world. Um, it was also a bit of the uh, American manifest destiny idea of the, 19, of the, of the uh, 1800s, the 19th century. Vast, unconquered territories out there that needed to be peopled, they needed to be industrialized, they needed to be conquered. And uh, that's indeed what Russia embarked upon in the 1970s in, in its industrialization programs out further east and east, rather than west as we've done further east. Uh, and there was also a security motive. The idea that somehow learning from World War II experience and the invasion uh, of, of Nazi Germany pushing deep into European Russian territory, let's start locating our big defense plants further back behind the Urals. And the defense plants were the biggest of them all, the biggest and the heaviest manufacturers of them all, producing not only defense goods, but all kinds of heavy civilian equipment, tractors and railroad cars, anything that was big and heavy. These were being produced in the defense plant. So perceived security concerns pushed it back. Now, this sort of process of expanding in this way, and not least the territorial aspect, the geographical aspect of this, meant that production became even more costly. That is, and when we say costly, we mean more inputs are needed to produce the same amount, same output, no, per unit output. More labor inputs, more labor inputs, more materials inputs, more components. Um, but because, again, because of the absence of a market price mechanism, there's no way to immediately see how costly this is, how economically wasteful it was. In fact, rather than seeing rising cost as something negative, they were implicitly regarded as something good. Now, how could that be? Well, the reason is because more cost mean more inputs. More inputs mean more jobs. More jobs mean more social stability in pretty much any economy in the world, including our own. Um, so that's the process that's going on. And then the 19, right at the, at the boundary to the 1980s, world oil prices just collapse. Not quite as sharply and deeply as they did, as we saw in 2008, but they may be in more damaging they, they keep going down over a period of almost a whole decade. Um, now, it's a long story. We can make it short. The oil price collapse that began really in its vicious form in the early 1980s eventually led to the collapse of the USSR and the Soviet system. Uh, it was not the dis disappearance of the rents alone that caused the collapse, but it, 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 it was the way in which this was managed. And let me describe. Because, as I said, the rise in oil prices in the early 70s had revived temporarily, as it turned out, a moribund Soviet system. The big problem was that the addiction that arose from that oil rent windfall made the system much more fragile than before because, as I say, the more you have, the more you need to keep it going. Um, the rent boom had allowed the regime to buy, if you in quotes, buy legitimacy through a deal with society to continue to provide welfare, uh, at least in the form of absolute job security. It had also given the Soviet leadership the means to um, buy, not legitimacy, but buy loyalty from their East, German, uh, East European satellite countries, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and so forth. Um, it exercised, if you like, soft power. Of course, they had armed forces stationed in these countries, but with few exceptions, they did not use those armed forces, and at the end, had they tried to, I think it would have been disastrous. They didn't have to even test that, for the most part, because they could continue to subsidize these countries through their, their oil. And so when the rents disappear, when this, these tools, these levers that they have both domestically and in foreign policy, suddenly disappear, the leaders of the Soviet regime had no alternative but 
to look for ways to work. We have to have find something to replace this missing value that we were getting from the oil to infuse value into their system. And what they did was they turned to Western banks to borrow money to replace the absent rents. Initially, it was very easy for the Soviet Union to borrow from Western private banks. Um, it's like a completely unmortgaged uh, borrower coming there with great credit rating uh, and saying, you know, we'd love to we'd take some loans. So they, everybody was, was climbing all over each other to lend money to the Soviet Union at that time. But what happened was that the volume of loans, again, this addiction phenomenon, the more they got, the more they needed, the volume of loans required to maintain the addicted system very soon outpaced the willingness even of the largest Western private banks to extend credit. The banks then turned to their governments and said, look, you've got you've to handle this. This is bigger than, than anything we can deal with. So they hand over this credit-hungry client to governments that continued to give credit to the USSR. The governments, however, have a different leverage over the USSR than private banks. They attached political conditions to their loans. And they were in a position to simply say, we will not give you any more loans unless you, the Soviet leadership, swear not to use force in Eastern Europe. And once that deal was made, Soviet leadership had no other choice. They had to, had to accept those conditions. That was effectively the end of the Soviet empire. It was well known to everybody, every single uh, leader in the East Bloc and the populations as well. This post-Soviet Russia, let me jump ahead. Now, okay, Soviet Union, whole Soviet system collapsed. Post-Soviet Russia had no leverage whatever to renew the uh, credit line from the West. And in fact, not only, this is not a, 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 a pretty a rosy or proud chapter of our history of relations with post-Soviet Russia, by the way. Not only did uh, Western banks and governments uh, refuse to give new loans to post-Soviet Russia, they actually demanded that Russia repay all the Soviet-era debt in full. Uh, you know, you're on the one hand praising them for overthrowing communism, but okay, you guys need to pay back all the debts the communists took. So with neither, with, with, with neither resource rents, oil prices at historic lows, so they don't have the, the, the value coming in from their own oil and gas any more than they did before the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, and no credits. Russia was starved of rents for almost the entire decade of the 1990s. Um, what happened there is a fascinating story in its own right. Because of these uh, production chains, because of the relationships among these enterprises, these, these big production enterprises, especially in the defense industry sector, with each other, the whole supply chains I described from bottom to top, um, they, with almost bottom-up sort of organization, kept themselves going without cash, without money. They did it through uh, incredibly complicated and innovative techniques of barter, mutual offsets, and all sorts of things going on. Um, it's been described as the virtual economy as opposed to a real economy. It was a very peculiarized system. Uh, essentially, this was an era, I remember I said, rent management, control of the flow of rents, alternates between centralized and decentralized. This was the ultimate decentralized rent management period. Uh, and as a result, this is, it's really remarkable, uh, despite all the revolutionary changes that occurred in Russia in the 1990s, the inherited structure of the economy remained. Uh, the structure that had been built by and on the assumption of continued rents flowing in. They hung on tenaciously. Um, you would have thought these big, big uh, plants would have been just shut down. Uh, they weren't. They couldn't be. It was a social imperative that they continue to operate simply because they had become so important for the structure of society, the fabric of society. And to fast forward, by the end of the 1990s, around 1999, the oil price starts to rebound again. Um, it's like the dope peddlers back on the scene. You know, you, they've, the, the, they've gone through throes of withdrawal, these addicts, but they're still there. And, and the peddler is back again passing out cheap dope. So they had survived that period. They were poised again to claim their share, share of rents. But 
now, this new period of climbing rents, it bounced around a little bit in the beginning, and then it, around 2003, 2004, it, it, it sort of begins a pretty steady upward climb with some bumps until 2008. That new upswing and growth of rents coincides with a new political leadership in Russia. And as it turns out, the new leader, that's Putin, introduces a new system of rent management that I'd, I'm going to talk about in a second. Just before I move on to talking about the Putin era, I want to just say, okay, let's step back and look. I've described all this long history. Let's look at it through the prism of, quickly and in a very succinct way, through the prism of the volume of, of oil and gas rents, oil and gas wealth that we're talking about. Because it's very simple to compute the, the real value of Russia's oil and gas rents each year. You just take the volume of, of oil and gas produced on the territory of the Russian Federation each year and multiply it by its real market value, depend, irrespective of whether it's sold at that market value. That's what it's worth. And so you can get a picture like this. Very closely tracks, obviously, the world oil price. Gas prices track oil prices. Uh, and even though there's been adjustments in the quantities of oil and gas produced in Russia over this period from 1970 to the present, it's swamped by the increases and decreases in prices. And I just want to ask you, to the extent that you remember anything about your Russian history or Soviet history, what does this say about the various political leaders over this period and the challenges they faced? Just think of it in this way. Um, you know, the incredible optimism and, and almost aggressivity of the Brezhnev regime uh, up until the period when the oil prices start to come down. He then, with a couple of intermediaries, a couple of interim individuals, hands it all over to poor Gorbachev. He, he, he did not stand a chance. Because think of, again, in terms of addiction. Gorbachev inherits a system with all these hungry or whatever you call addicts that are desperate for their dope. And they're there. They've all been built up under this period of wealth, of, of oil and gas wealth. They need their fix. And Gorbachev doesn't have anything to give them. And I described what happened when he had to turn to foreign loans. Yeltsin maybe had even less of a chance than, than Gorbachev did. Uh, and Putin, in contrast, comes in at exactly the point when all this is just reversing itself. Um, it's not a terrible oversimplification to say that the fates of each of these leaders, from Brezhnev on, Brezhnev died in 1982, was determined by the volume of rents they had at their disposal and the manner in which they collected and reallocated those rents. But of all those leaders, I think none was more conscious of deliberately establishing a system of rent management than Putin. From the very beginning, Vladimir Putin saw control over the rent flows as the key to his stated, explicitly stated, two main strategic goals as president of the country. He stated these goals before he became president. The goals were, number one, regain national sovereignty for Russia, and number two, ensure domestic cohesion and stability. These two things are related. You will not have a sovereign Russia without a Russia that is united domestically and stable. But we can distinguish between the two in terms of policies that he took to to ensure sovereignty on the one hand and stability on the other. So sovereignty, stability become priorities for the use of the rents. Um, I, we just went through this story of, of the collapse of the Soviet Union driven by the sudden contraction of rents and the massive foreign borrowing that ensued and the political leverage that that gave to the West over the USSR. Putin is a student of history, among other things, um, and he realized there is a lesson to be learned in what happened in the late Soviet Union. The logic was straightforward. The USSR, it's just a simple fact, the USSR did not collapse because it was defeated militarily. It did not collapse because it didn't have enough weapons. It collapsed because it lost political sovereignty, and it lost political sovereignty when it lost its financial sovereignty. Lesson, pretty obvious. Russia must restore its financial sovereignty if it is going to restore its political sovereignty. And believe me, Russians were acutely aware during the 1990s of the loss, almost, almost the fatal, irrevocable loss of political sovereignty. Um, Putin's plan to restore financial sovereignty was simple. Three steps. One, start collecting as this rent 
is now flowing back into the country as oil and gas prices rise. This has to be collected to the center, to the federal government, which can reestablish governmental functions which were in complete disarray during the 1990s. Nothing worked. Nobody could count on the state, the government, to do anything right. Uh, it was a free-for-all. So that, though we, we had to collect the taxes, says Putin, so he starts a broad tax reform. Um, and it, there were some changes in rates, and that's been given a lot of publicity about a flat tax and so forth. That, was, that part of it was, was completely secondary or tertiary. The main thing was simply collecting taxes, tax administration, and doing so with a fairly dramatic and harsh methods in the beginning, uh, sending out guys with Kalashnikovs and black ski masks into the head offices of some of these corporations that weren't paying their taxes. The next step was to use this collected, the tax revenues being collected, to what? Pay off the foreign debt. That's, what's, that's, the, that's the stumbling block. That's the key. We have to pay off the foreign debt. The third was to go beyond that. Once paying off, having paid off the foreign debt, start building up the foreign exchange reserves. You just switch things. And the record is impressive. When he began his first term as president in January 2000, the Russian government owed $133 billion to foreign creditors. In its foreign exchange reserves, it had a grand total of $8.5, $8.5 billion. By the middle of 2008, it had reduced the debt to virtually nothing um, in terms of, of, of long-term term debt, uh, and it had built up, you know, what was $8.5 billion was now $600 billion in reserves. The leverage was completely reversed, and if you just look at, oops, I thought I had a chart here that I may not have. Oh, sorry, there's something missing. But um, the, the, the chart that I'm looking at was, or trying to, to have you envision, shows the growth of the foreign exchange reserves and the, and the building down, if you like, building up of foreign exchange reserves, building down of, of uh, foreign debt. Very interesting that they intersect about 2004 when uh, uh, Putin finishes his first term and begins his second term. Um, because there's a very important milestone right at about that point. In January 2005, Russia paid off, uh, Putin, Russia paid off the debt of the country to the IMF three and a half years ahead of schedule and actually unexpected for the IMF. They were not expecting Russia to, to, to come with the check and say, here, we're, we're, we're finished with you guys. We're all even now. And uh, you can pack up your office and leave, leave Moscow. Um, as a footnote for those who are interested in national security issues, I can point out that it's pretty obvious that financial security was a much higher priority for Putin than military security in these years because they spent virtually nothing on, on military spending during these years, but were using all the money to pay off the foreign debt. So what I've said now is about this sovereignty uh, goal. The other uh, goal for using the rents was about stability. Uh, and this required sharing the rent broadly throughout society. Um, you had to make sure, as I said, that these factories, that these giant cities based on the factories uh, continued to survive and if, if, if they could to, 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 uh, to prosper. To do that, you had to use every means possible to share the rents. Now, a lot of this was shared through the budget. As I said, you're collecting uh, this rent into the federal budget, so you have government programs for either subsidizing various industries, placing government orders with the industries, but most of it in the beginning and even today is rents that are shared not in the formal way, but informally. Um, I'm not going to into a lot of detail in this, but it, it really has to do with the idea that the resource industries in Russia are um, paying formal taxes. They're paying what we regard as the normal taxes. In fact, oil industries in Russia pay a multiple, a whole list of different kinds of, of taxes, revenues that go in cash into the government and then are redispersed, re-transferred back out into society as we would do here through, through a budget. And most of that is fairly transparent, actually. Uh, we know what's going on. But a large part of the rents are shared in much less transparent ways and much less 
not just trans non-transparent in the sense of being corrupt, there's an element of that as well, but in a way that is very much of the old Soviet notion, where, uh, if you like, costs are being incurred without people having the ability to recognize how much it actually costs society as a whole. And a lot of that has to do with insisting, using the power of the government, the central government, to insist that these production chains be maintained. That it is your obligation, Mr. Oligarch, whoever, or Mr. Deripaska, who is the big aluminum oligarch, you must make sure that a certain amount of your aluminum goes to these factories in these areas here. Because if it doesn't, those factories can't continue pr to produce. And even if you have a better offer somewhere else, even if you could sell this, export it, and sell it at a higher price, you must uh, fulfill your social function inside this country by doing that. You lock all these companies, even though they're privately owned, many of them, into these production chains for the benefit of keeping the ultimate, if you like, in a way, the ultimate target of all of this are the big, heavy, so-called machine-building plants, the ones that produce uh, the heavy equipment. And again, most all of those are defense plants. In fact, they're still categorized, categorized as defense plants, though they may not, for the moment, be producing primarily defense goods. Uh, but they're subject to a number of restrictions about defense goods. Um, those were the priorities for distributing the rent for, for, for Putin in order to ensure the second goal, the one uh, social stability, uh, the other being the, the sovereignty goal. The most important piece of the story, though, is missing, and that is, it's one thing to say what he wanted to do with the rent, but how was he able to do it? How did he have the power, especially on this point of dealing with some very powerful private business owners that they basically ran the country in the second half of the 1990s. They owned the state. How could he force them to pay their taxes? And especially, how could he force them and continue to force them to fulfill their social functions uh, by, by participating in these production chains? It's not enough to say that, well, he was president of Russia. He controlled the police, the security services, and so forth. Um, Yeltsin was president of Russia. He couldn't do this. He tried. He tried desperately to do it. Uh, and in fact, it was Yeltsin who handed over the oil companies and the other resource companies, I'm thinking of metals, iron, steel, aluminum, other metals companies, to, uh, to private owners because he desperately needed their political support, he needed their media support, and he needed their money. So he eff effectively made a swap there. Uh, it was called loans for shares, but nobody uh, seriously thought that these were loans. These rich, the richest, uh, so-called oligarchs in Russia, gave the money to the government in 1996 so that Yeltsin could defeat the communists, be re-elected as president, and in return, Yeltsin handed over to them all of these industries. Um, Putin, there's a huge difference then between Putin and Yeltsin, and it has to do with the way they dealt with these oligarchs. Uh, we might start by saying, well, what did not happen? Um, it's a kind of a dog that didn't bark story because many people associate Vladimir Putin with this ruthless guy who wants to renationalize all the private industries, does all kinds of things there, but one of the you know, centerpieces is that somehow he wants to, to uh, recreate an old Soviet-style economy. He didn't do that. Uh, and, the, and even more interesting is the reason he didn't do it, the reason he's not doing it, and the reason he won't do it uh, under any scenario I can see is that he knew that would take him a step away from where he wanted to go with Russia. He wanted the Russian economy to be strong and competitive, and he has known all along, even before he became prime minister and president, that the market economy is superior to a state-owned and state-run economy. He is not a crypto-Soviet leader. Uh, he knows that private owners and a market economy are needed to make Russia competitive. Uh, he He's not a man of ideology at all. He's the ultimate pragmatist. He, as I said, is someone who learns lessons from history. And among the lessons, in addition to the one I mentioned about the, taking the foreign debts, it's simply a lesson of history that the Soviet system of state ownership and centralized planning failed. Um, Stalin and his communist successors 
saw capitalists and entrepreneurs as enemies of the state, Putin sees them as potential assets. And I hope, yes, okay. So um, his dilemma, they are potential assets, but they have to be harnessed. They have completely different priorities, these private owners, than I, he, or he's, his team would have as, as leaders of, of Russia. Uh, but we have got to find a way to, to make them work for you. And uh, one of the best examples or the best statement of how they think, that whole team thinks, comes maybe not directly from Putin, but from his close associate, sort of the ideologue. I said Putin's not an ideologue, but I think he has a guy close to him who tends to formulate terms, things almost in ideological terms. His name's Vladislav Surkov. And already back in 2000, um, he, he formulated it this way. He said, the stratum of truly leading entrepreneurs in Russia is, quote, very thin and very precious. They are the bearers of capital, of intellect, of technology. And this is the great line. Quote, the oil men, that is the guys who, who revive these industries, the private owners of the oil sector are no less important than the oil. The state has to make the most of them both. It's a beautiful statement because that encapsulates the whole idea of what Russia was, uh, what Putin was trying to do. Uh, now, the way in which he did it was to, he came to Moscow, Putin did, in 1996. He was virtually a, an unknown, completely unknown. Uh, he worked at a very low level in the Kremlin, uh, way below the radar, not just below the radar, but way below the radar. But he happened because of who he had been, who he was, his career path in the KGB, uh, and his his uh, performance as deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, Russia's second big, biggest city, he was brought to Moscow for the express purpose. Remember I said Yeltsin tried to control the oligarchs. He gave away the property, but he also thought he needed to control them. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it with a direct head-on approach. His close associate, his sort of chief, chief of staff and chief economics uh, person, Anatoly Chubais, knew about Putin. He also knew about the current Russian finance minister, Kudrin, who probably was more important than Putin at the time. And he knew that these guys maybe had some techniques that nobody in Moscow actually had, uh, a little bit more of secret service types of approach. How you, how he knew that Putin, Putin had never been a spy, per se. Putin was a, a field officer. He was a, a person who identified potential spies, recruits, and had to recruit them, and he had to run them. He had to... So Putin likes to say his talent was working with people. Um, <laughs> and he said that a couple of times. And that's what he learned in the KGB. And it's, it's really manipulation. It's, 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 in that sense, working with people. So for the guys who brought Putin to Moscow, basically their intention was that somehow he could apply those talents to their, their shared goal of controlling these oligarchs. And indeed, that's that's what, Put what Putin did. It's a story that's really not been well told at all, if, if at all, about what he was doing because often the, the accounts will say when Putin was nominated as prime minister by Yeltsin in August of 1999 and then later in that year designated as his successor uh, when, when Yeltsin steps down prematurely as president, this, this unknown, this gray guy, nobody knows who he is or what he was all about. There was, in fact, some information about, about what he was, but not much. Um, but Putin took advantage of that position he was in from 96 to 99, really 96, to, well, 96 to 99, he moves through a succession of agencies, all of which share the common characteristic that what Putin was doing there was collecting financial intelligence, financial information, financial intelligence about these major corporations and their owners. And so when he comes in as president, acting president in 2000, first thing he does is call them to a meeting, the oligarchs. Small number of these guys. It was just a handful. Uh, and they had already organized themselves, by the way. And uh, the, their pro they were facing a problem because they had united, the oligarchs, the, the bankers at the beginning as bankers, had united with each other to push through that deal with Yeltsin to get the property. As soon as they get the property, they successfully do it, they successfully ensure Yeltsin's, Yeltsin's re-election, they're then at, at, at each other's throats as you might expect, uh, trying to gain the upper hand on all that. And they were about to destroy each other. It was really this, this vicious form of internecine warfare 
that erupted in something called the Bankers' War. And they were aware, well, of, well aware of the problem. The, their problem was that if they continued doing this, they were going to destroy each other and they were going to destroy the whole system and, you know, the communists would be back and we'd all be hanging from, from lampposts. Um, but they didn't know how to solve the problem. They could not obviously assign any one of their number to be the leader because they didn't trust each other. It, there's a nice historical parallel. In fact, the only historical parallel that I know of this is the mafia wars in the United States in the 1930s. The families, you know, about to, you know, at the very time that they're under pressure from the FBI and everybody trying to clean them up, they're destroying each other. How do you solve this? In the U.S., what happens was Lucky Luciano comes in and says, let's form the National Commission and we'll sit down. And he imposes uh, a peace among them, which they agree is, is, is the smart thing. Vladimir Putin is Lucky Luciano. That's what he did. He came to the oligarchs and he said, I am contrary to what people are saying. I am not against you guys. I am not going to nationalize you. I'm not going to take away your property. In fact, I think you should get very rich as long as you do it by building up your companies and making them prosperous and exporting more and so forth. Uh, but I need you to pay your taxes. But one thing I will tell you, I can do for you and nobody else can do, is I can protect you against each other because I have weapons that will destroy all of you. And by the way, you may not have noticed it, I think they had, that I have a monopoly on that information and its collection of any further information because that's exactly what he did. He, he went systematically through agency after agency, culminating in the, in the, the successor to the KGB, and gained control over the subsectors in those that collected this financial intelligence. He was the only, he and his associates, very close associates, were the only ones who were in a position to collect this anymore. There was nobody left for the oligarchs to bribe to get this stuff. So he can effectively say, it's, it's like a, a situation in which a bunch of different countries, not just two, the United States and the Soviet Union, have nuclear weapons and mutually assured destruction. It's a multiple collection of countries that have nuclear weapons, they could mutually destroy each other. They can't, you know, what are you going to do? Oh, let's all give them all to country A. Yeah, right. They, nobody trusts that country A. You need someone from the outside to come in, an international, multinational agency that puts them under lock and key, and everybody knows if I give them to that agency, nobody else can get them, right? Okay, we're all, you know, you're, you're all sure. That's what Putin could really credibly say to these guys. Look, I can do this. But in return, you need to do something for me. And so he had um, a deal. And here are the details. They, the oligarchs, get to keep their property. And by the way, it was you know, generally recognized in Russian society as completely illegitimate. These guys were hated. I mean, any popular vote would have said, disappropriate them, take that stuff back. You know, they stole from all of us. That's what general sentiment was. So Putin is saying, no, I'll protect you from the population. I'll protect you from the communists. Uh, you can manage your, I'm not going to micro, I'm not going back to central planning. So you can manage these companies. You can grow the companies. You can personally get richer. And as I say, be protected against the expropriation or worse. But in return, I need you, number one, you've got to start paying your taxes. They weren't doing it. You need to pay them in cash. You need to pay them in full. Don't collude with governors to give them some pittance and claim that you paid your taxes, this sort of stuff, and, and pay nothing to the federal government. I need you to share your wealth informally. I talked about this notion of participating in the production chains. Engage in philanthropy. That's uh, a very interesting episode or chapter of this because U.S. and Western foundations were spending a lot of money in Russia at the time, and Putin was very irritated at that and said, you guys are incredibly wealthy. You need to start doing this yourselves. And they did. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to you know, these businesses are so important, they are so big, uh, something as seemingly innocuous for a normal business of mergers and acquisitions abroad, they become strategic decisions determining the fate of the Russian nation. You cannot be allowed to make those on your own. You need to come to me. Let's talk about it. Let's make sure it's okay. Um, so all of this is unwritten, but it's, I think, quite explicit in terms of those. And that's that's the system. That's the meaning of the term. There should be the meaning. It's not by most people who use it of Kremlin Incorporated or Russia Incorporated because it really is Putin and a number of close associates as a kind of board of directors. And the division managers in this giant corporation, some of them are called ministers in the government. Some of them are called CEOs and owners of, you know, called oligarchs. 
but they're sort of all in that together. Uh, and uh, I haven't even mentioned the name, Medvedev, who's the president of the country. Um, it's not clear. I mean, he's definitely part of the team, but he's not an operational member of this particular system. I think he plays an important role. Will remains to be seen whether he'll continue to play that role, but he's not the key person. There are really three key people, and you may not even know who these guys are. Obviously, you know the big one at the top. That's Putin. Uh, but the other two are remarkably important people. This guy's name is Igor Sechin. Uh, that guy's name is Viktor Zubkov. And, uh, well, you know, you look at them and you look at those expressions and you just can't <laughs> resist adding the, the captions. And, in fact, that's kind of what their roles are. That's, that's sort of what their roles are. And whether Dmitry Medvedev is Michael Corleone, I don't know. That remains to be said. Um, but here's, here's important. I mentioned this thing about the, the, the uh, system. And I've talked now about the, the priorities for the use of the rents. Um, I've gone through this about that was the chart I was looking for before. I had it out of, out of the order that I thought it did. But, uh, and that's my rent sharing. So another name to be mentioned is Hodorkovsky. I won't mention it now, but if anybody's interested in it. He was a member of this deal. He was an initial member of the deal. In fact, he was the poster boy of the deal. But he, he broke the rules, and uh, he paid for it. But look, for everybody else, nobody else has tried to break the deal since the Hodorkovsky was arrested and sent to the gulag. But you, know, you can say, well, wow, those poor oligarchs. You know, Look what happened to Hodorkovsky. Well, pff, poor oligarchs. The uh, Forbes billionaires list they publish every year in 2000 when he makes the deal. There are four Russians on the list. Their total wealth, 12 billion. By 2008, 87, their total wealth, 470. So they've, they've done all right. So it's not so surprising that they've played the game. Um, the important future issue for Russia, it's really the over, overarching issue, is, is again, what, what's going to be happening with these oil and gas rents? Um, and quickly to wrap up here, well, the rent is simply, as I said, it's price times quantity. Russia doesn't control the world oil price. Russia is, is the largest producer of oil in the world. It has nowhere near the leverage that the Gulf oil producers have. Why? Because uh, Russia's oil is, is much more expensive oil. It can't just turn it off and on, uh, at least figuratively, the way the Saudis can. It, it, OPEC can adjust. O Russia is not a member of OPEC. Russia can't adjust its oil production in the short term like this. Um, and so it's free riding, really, on what OPEC does. If, to the extent that OPEC has power, people dispute that. If OPEC is holding, keeping the world oil price up, Russia is sort of free riding on that. Uh, and Russia's problem is really the same as we have, times you know, 100 or 1,000. Russia doesn't know the future oil price. For us as consumers, that's an inconvenience. And for industries that are heavily dependent on the oil price, like air, airlines or whatever, it's pretty critical, but they, there's ways they can hedge those, uh, the, the, those, those issues. Russia can't. Russia's an oil producer, and it, it is, its future is really highly dependent on the oil price. Um, and here's the way it all boils down. It's not a question of these short-term volatility. You can deal with the short-term volatility, build up oil, uh, uh, petroleum reserve funds, and so forth. You can, you can sort of ride out the tough years if they just last a couple of years. The real issue is, if you look at this long history of the oil price from 1880 to the present, you see that for virtually 100 years, the oil price, the, the mean oil price was under $20 a barrel. These are current price, you know, today's prices. But on the other hand, since the 1970s, we've been in a, a very different regime, or have we? It's no, you know, nobody can really say, is, is it going, ba any come back down? Are we ultimately destined? We always think at any given point that today's trend is going to last forever. Though we know it doesn't. We say, oh, of course it doesn't. Intellectually, we know this. It'll, so, but always, nah, but. So go to the EIA or the IEA, the agencies that talk about forecasting world oil supply and demand and prices. They think the world oil price is going to keep going up. And... Uh, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. I mean, as far as quantity is concerned, as I indicated in the beginning, there's some real issues about Russia's future oil. Um, what they've been living off so far has been, some people call it easy oil, but that's a very relative term. No ro oil in Russia is easy compared to the Gulf oil. 
But it is legacy oil. The infrastructure, the fields, and everything were developed during the Soviet system. And that is now exhausting its potential. And Russia is going to have to make a decision. Are they going to make a big, big uh, effort into developing replacement sources in eastern Siberia, the Far East, the Arctic, uh, much colder, much more remote, and much more costly? So is Russia running out of oil? Is we were talking about peak oil? Well, yeah, if you talk about the legacy oil. But no, I mean, nobody really knows what it is. So it's a question of the, of the cost and the price and the risk, and the risk. Um, but let me just point out that if you were to believe these main forecasts by the international agencies about, about the oil, well, they, they, that's what they say. The red line is what they say, you know, with leeway given for, for fluctuations up and down. They just say the oil price is going to trend upward. This was like less than a year ago, a forecast where they're making a bold assertion that the oil price would go up to $120 a barrel by 2030. That's outrageous. Oh, wait, that's what it is right now, you know. So, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll have to revise these forecasts. And, and so people are talking about $200 a, a barrel and so forth. Well, just as a little exercise, suppose we assume that that's what's going to happen with the oil price, and we, again, multiply it by the quantities that Russia is going to produce. That looks pretty good. Um, but it looks a lot better than it really is because, you know, this, the, 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 the increase, right, the slope of that increase in the striped area is not as steep as the slope in those first Putin years. And uh, so it's, it's, it'll, it'll, it'll be good for Russia, but it won't be some kind of magic bullet that's going to make a booming Russia. It's on its own would make a moderately growing Russian economy. However, um, I think that we just have to keep remembering this fundamental lesson that I said that Putin uh, drew about keeping financial sovereignty as the way to keep political sovereignty. For him, uh, he knows, and I think this is absolutely important to keep in mind, that Russia doesn't have to be a great, healthy, it doesn't have to be a modern economy, it doesn't have to look like us, it doesn't have to even have healthy people um, to be a country that we that behaves in ways that apparently a lot of people don't really like because it's uh, it, it feels itself independent and sovereign and people describe it as assertive or even aggressive it just needs political sovereignty that's the difference between today Putin's Russia and Yeltsin's Russia is all about one didn't have political sovereignty the other does uh, Putin achieved that political sovereignty and he's not going to sacrifice it so uh, it would take it's not unthinkable that he could lose it or it could be lost but it will be uh, pretty much the last thing that happens, and, and therefore the Russia we see today may show different levels of economic performance, but it's still, I believe, going to be a Russia that acts very independently and very differently than the Russia of the 1990s. Uh, one quick slide I love to always show just to give you an indication of, um, <laughs> think about Invest, you know, think about Putin as the investor in the Russian economy beginning in, 19, in, in 2000. And uh, he made a bet, and that bet has paid off big time. And this is literally true. If you had, the, again, I'm thinking about the stock market indices. Suppose there were index funds for every one of the major stock markets, and you had $100 in January 2000, and you had invested in you know, the Japanese stock market, the FTSE, the S&P 500, and so on across the board, and in the Russian stock market. Uh, as of yesterday or whenever, it would have Friday. That's what it, the different comparisons would look like. Russia's far and away would have been the best bet you could have made. Uh, my point is not that anybody would have been so you know, lucky as to do this, but it's, it's sort of the mentality. If, if you had done that, if you had made that bet, and you had put your money, your $100 on Russia, I suspect that you'd be feeling pretty sure of yourself, you know, looking on everybody else. And so, uh, again, think of it as, as the current Russian leadership who's saying, we made this bet. This is what we did with the country. Yeah, we're aware of the fact that there were a lot of very fortunate external circumstances that helped us along the way. But this is what we did. This is where we are. Hey, have you guys done so well? You know, <laughs> so looking at, 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 at especially these red uh, blocks down here that are the Western countries and the major, major Western economies. I know I've gone way past my time, so let me conclude here um, and see if you have 
questions or comments that I can answer uh, if anybody is willing to pose them and stay. Sure. Coming, and we hope we'll see you in the fall.